Phil was really excited to, to know that he was going right after lunch. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 We put yeah. yeah. Phil here on purpose, though. Yeah. 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 Phil will get us all lathered up. It'll be great. Uh, I'm excited about his class. Uh, I'm not going to take up any more of his time. Take it away, Phil. Uh, I'm going to have um, Jeremy hit a video. Um, this will be the, the, the session that's going to be different probably than all the other sessions because I want to practically talk about meditation. I want to define uh, meditation. There's an Eastern heritage. There's certainly a Western heritage. And then there, there's our heritage, which is we don't teach about it, we don't talk about it. <laughs> oh, that's right. We don't do it, do we? And yet it's, it's a foundational principle uh, within the scriptures. And so we've, we've got to get out of our arrogance, our hubris, and kind of go, wow, maybe this is one of the tool sets we're missing, and maybe that's one of the reasons we're not as effective as we need to be. I want to talk a little about your brain. Your brain is an amazing thing. And so what it's doing right now is it's a data sponge, and it's absorbing data like you can't possibly imagine. That's a good thing because if you were overwhelmed with all the data it's picking up right now, you would absolutely go schizophrenic. And so by God's design, there are massive filters going on so that of all the stimulation going on right now that you're perceiving, some of it actually becomes perception. You actually don't have to worry that your heart's on its 72nd beat or that your lung is inflated at so many CFM and pressure points, right? Thank the Lord so that you're freed up to go, oh, I'm hungry. I'm, oh, here comes a tiger. I'm in trouble. That's called perception. And I'm going to make a point that we spend a whole lot of time right here, day by day. We occasionally get to a realm of discernment. And this is why people go to work and they actually like their work. Because all this is going on, and this is going on, and then you actually get to apply something where discernment actually works for you, and you go, oh, if I do this, this happens. If that happens, this happens. If I do this, I make money. If I do that, I don't make money. And so discernment is really what keeps most of humanity going. But then there's a the final step. I call it enlightenment. You can call it inspiration. You can call it whatever you want to call it, where you go to a higher level of consciousness. Yes, I said it, so I'm not going to make you break out the beads or anything like that. <laughs> but this is real. So hit the video. Just watch the video. Listen to the video. Don't analyze the video. Absorb the video.
That Japanese woman could hit a four-inch bullseye 100 yards away. Do you think she just picked up a bow yesterday? Do you think somebody said, hey, what you need to do is hit a four-inch bullseye 100 yards away? That's what you need to do. I just gave you our analogy of be like Jesus. Hit the four-inch 100 yards away. So there's a long distance between where she started in her training or how that cheetah is hardwired. You know, a cheetah runs at 70 miles an hour. There is such hardwiring in that animal that if there is the slightest delta on, on shift or anything, it goes rolling and tumbling and probably breaks its neck. And you saw the beautiful gymnast. And what, what, what's the commonality going on here? Are, are they sitting around thinking? Are they? Are they caught up in stimuli? Are they caught up in going, oh, you know what? I smell something in the gym right now. Are they even sitting going, oh, the wood feels a little bit hard today? No, they're in the realm of enlightenment. I mean, anybody, any athlete, any scientist, anybody who has done something amazing, outstanding, that has propelled our entire civilization is living not in the realm of here, or even occasionally here, but in this realm. And I'm going to submit to you that this is a form of meditative practice that they have done for years to get to this level. Do they have the Holy Spirit with them? I don't know. Maybe some do. Probably most don't. And so there is human capability designed by God to go to a much higher level of consciousness. But we're all caught up here, aren't we? Oh, where's my cell phone? Right? You know, right now they say that the average person is checking their cell phone anywhere from 50 to 500 times a day. And I believe never have we needed the good old application of the tool set of God called meditation. I don't have time, just jot it down. Joshua 1's a really good one. Hey, Josh, got a big thing for you to do. I'm checking out. I'm Moshe. I'm Moses. By the way, take over the entire promised land. And while you're at it, why don't you meditate day and night, day and night on my Torah? Now, let's stop right there. What do you think meditation means? Anybody? Come on. Doesn't it mean to mutter or to murmur? What's that? To mutter, to repeat something? Oh, that is a rarefied form of Eastern application. We'll get into that. And for some, it's helpful for where they're trying to go. But come on, what's meditation? Consider. Ponder. What's that? Ponder. Yeah, I'm pondering your bottles right there. and I'm pondering that hat. Yeah. Meditation. Is it um, a way of communicating with the higher source? Oh, I, I think it's all about communication, but here's what we got to do to start meditation. We got to shut down the mind. What did I just say earlier in that video? They're attaining a level of performance and consciousness because they're not thinking. All of the claptrap has been shut aside. And they can focus at a level that causes human performance that to us is amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, I believe in God-given gifts and all this, but I also think that when you begin to understand this and practice it, yeah, you can become excellent in, in all ways. Guys, I'm going to let you in on a secret. There's billions of people, I don't know, billions, hundreds of billions of people that practice very dedicated, rigorous meditation every day and they're gaining great, great benefit from it. Morally, ethically, you name it, they're outstanding people, Buddhist, and they are not on a salvation track. And so we dismiss all of that amazing growth spiritually because they're not on our salvation track. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So we throw out one of the most significant babies with the bathwater. And so your scriptures are full of meditation. i got another clue for you. Your scriptures and the culture that wrote your scriptures came from the Near East, part of the great oriental tradition. 
And I'll show you that our prophets and our men of God and women of God knew all about meditation. And they practiced it. Okay, so uh, this is a good one. Tahalim, this Psalms 145, Ephesians 6. I love Ephesians 6. Grow powerfully in union with the Lord, union with His mighty strength. Use all the weaponry that God provides. So by all means, let's not fast. And let's not meditate. I have a lot of fun, but then I get real serious. And let's not teach on it. And let's not even talk about it. And what does Ephesians 6 tell us? It is part of the weaponry of God. Because if you can't control your mind, can you really do anything? I don't think so. For God, I mean, you may do little bits and pieces and here and there, and then you get distracted and all these things. Okay, general views, meditation. It's been practiced for thousands of years. It's proven that it reduces stress, depression, pain. This has gone from anecdotal to now it's scientifically proven. Reducing of blood pressures, all kinds of things. So it really, 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 really does work. It's under research, all kinds of other health benefits. There's basically two big ways coming out of the East. One is focused attention. One is no thought. Focused attention is you actually fixate on something. And this is where you get the beads and the bells and the bowls. You know what I'm saying? But it is, guys, don't get freaked out by the silly little toys they're using. They're doing something powerful because they're taking time every day to focus their mind. And I say if a bowl resonating does it for you, then do it. Or if a beautiful landscape does it for you, do it. You see, you see what I'm saying? If you need the beads, go for the beads. But let us start meditating because I think it's a powerful tool. Uh, I, listen, if you've got any questions on the traditions, come and give me a call, okay? There's a Buddhist tradition. And the whole goal there is to become aware of how illusionary this life is, get focused on the things that matter, and out of release from this entrapment, you become enlightened. And it ain't heaven, guys. Nirvana from the Sanskrit, from the Pali, is the, the blowing out. Annihilation. Woo! I want that kind of salvation. No, we don't. Come on. God created us with the Holy Spirit. I mean, with the Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, this has evolved into all kinds of practices. Uh, you know it touches you. It touches you when you see a picture like that. And it kind of looks cool, doesn't it? There's something going on there. And let me tell you, Madison Avenue knows all about this. Because mm -hmm. these are images that capture your restless mind. And for a moment, you go, whoa. Apple figured this out long ago. No, I'm not kidding. And so you go, well, there's that. And then there's an apple. And it's shiny. And it looks good. And ooh, it attracts my mind. It attracts my mind. And so when you get into the Zen, there's different ways to, again, capture that mind, and that's all really good. Let's get into our traditions, okay? okay. There is a strong, strong Jewish tradition of meditation. In Bereshit 24, that's, that's Genesis, literally Yitzhak, Isaac, is in the field, and he's meditating. And guess what? Good news comes along the way. As he's meditating. You guys know that one? Yep. Revka, Rebecca, to be his wife. Guys, you're so not having fun here. <laughs> Come on. I'm going to start drawing, you know, good Jewish humor at you. Come on. <laughs> there are two Hebrew words for meditation. Haga, to sigh from the heart. I love that one. Siha, which means to move, to muse. To hold in one's mind. So then when the Tahalim, they say, Oh, meditate on my word day and night. A Jewish person goes, Yes, oh, Adonai Sevot. I hold that concept 
in my mind. I savor it. It stays there. It's, it penetrates my mind and into my heart. And it becomes something more animated than I just read another scripture. It starts to go from my cognitive awareness. And I think, I think the intersection of the mind and the heart and the soul is, in fact, inspiration and love. Have you ever listened to some of the most amazing, uh, um, you know, I don't know, arias or, or, or you know, uh, Beethoven's Fifth or what? It's, it's just breathtaking, isn't it? Yeah. You know, Handel's Messiah, when it crescendos at the, at the moment, uh, you just, you know, King George V just, or was it the fifth? No, King George II just had to stand up. When the king stands up, everybody stands up because he was so inspired. And the key here is letting God's spirit and God's word not just sit in your head like some more, some uh, data point or even, oh, I got some perception. I can disciple better now. But it gets into discernment and onto inspiration. Am I speaking to you at all? And this is the difference between, oh, well, you, you know, here's our options. No quiet time. Some quiet times. And then, oh, you're at least having quiet times a lot. Now let's dig into what is going on during those quiet times. Are they quiet? <laughs> and we have got to get back to this. We've got, this is such, this is so interesting right here. So anyway, uh, these practices, just read Psalms 119 over and over again, give access to mental development that can emanate only from God. The sensation of receiving divine inspiration awakens and liberates both heart, mind, and soul, permitting inward growth that transforms all aspects of normal life into an infinite of Adonai. Guys, Zechariah says there will come a time in Zechariah 14 when even the cooking pots in Jerusalem have on them holy to the Lord. And it's not a change of cooking utensils in Jerusalem. It is a transformation now that everything that is mundane is now transformed into a realm of holiness. Even the bells on the horses on their saddles will have holy to Adonai. Guys, this is a consciousness change. I appreciate so much what James was saying, guiding us, getting us to this point. Uh, and finally, I just got to get this. Okay, so meditative practice to understand the divine, the name, Shem, mindfulness of the, the word, the varam. Classic methods include the mental visualization of the soul, your soul, the nefesh, traveling through the heavens to achieve unity without or not. Uh, by all means, Jeremy, wave at me when I get too close to time. You're great. Okay, thank you. One of the best known types of meditation in early Judaism was the word called merbaka, meaning the chariot. And so you mentally are in a chariot and it's taking you closer to God. Uh, there's all kinds. Of, these will be handed out, right? So you can, you can look through these and have fun with them and, and read up on them and whatever. Okay, my whole point here is Judaism has always had, and it was given to the early church, a rich heritage of meditation. Always. We've got a strong Christian tradition, uh, more what I would call contemplation. Christian practices are rich, ancient. They tend to fall into contemplative arena. The strong influence of great philosophies, especially Stoicism, greatly affected the early Christian practices. Contemplation is a term for practice prayer in which a structure is attempted or, or made to get in touch with and deliberately reflect upon the revelations of God. Traditional Christian contemplation is a process of deliberately focusing specific thoughts, Christ's suffering, the creation, the exodus, and reflecting on their meaning in the context of the love of God. I think Dave Pocket is going to talk a lot more about this. They have prayer beads, prayer stations. This gets more into orthodoxy. Again, our heritage, our history immediately reacts to that. That's Catholic, that's Greek Orthodox, that's Russian Orthodox, that's weird, there's incense, there's robes. What are we doing here? And yet there is tremendous spirituality going on on an individual basis 
because there is an internalization of their walk and experience with Jesus on a daily basis. Listen, if you're having no quiet times, try some beads. Because at least you'll go, wow, I got, a, I got 99 more to go. <laughs> wow, that was hard. I've gotten through two. Here comes three. Here comes four. At least it focuses you. Am I recommending rosaries? No, hear me clearly. But don't be arrogant saying that if somebody is doing that, that you're more spiritual when you're not doing anything. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we are, we are roasted and, and, and savored in hubris. We are. I am. Sit there and have an attitude towards other religions when they're spending hours in meditative practice and study of God's word and prayer. And I get around to it when I somehow get out of this realm. Okay? Uh, practical applications. I think, this is now my opinion, I think meditation begins with thinking on scripture. That's what our scriptural heritage tells us, right? To meditate, our souls must reflect upon what our minds have brought in. There's the capture. Our hearts must rejoice in what our souls have grasped. There is a reason why you're told in the great Shema after the, the, the Annunciation to Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with what? Your heart, soul, mind. There's a reason for that because it has an additive effect. We meditate when we slowly read. I'm trying to give you some practicals here. Prayerfully contemplate and humbly accept what God has revealed to us in his word. This is dependent on internal energizing work of the spirit. We've already talked about that. The spirit has to work with you on this. Meditation is being attentive to God. The renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 1 through 2, is part of the process by which the word of God penetrates the soul and spirit with the light of illumination and the power of transformation. Guys, I believe in this. I believe in this so much that I'm going to, you know, I don't know, be preaching on this or teaching on this probably for the rest of my days. That there is a transformative power that's in you. Your double A spiritual battery called your soul, the nefesh is already there. It's been double powered up or triple or infinity powered up by the very Holy Spirit given to you at your baptism. So you're sitting there with this careening power source and all it's just generating, ready to break out, do great things. And we go to Momoville. It's like having a Ferrari. You go, yeah, I got a Ferrari. And it idles in my front yard all the time. And it's beautiful. And I know all about it. But the one thing I'm not doing is getting in my Ferrari, and I don't suggest you do this, but drive about 120 miles around a beautiful curve. <laughs> then you know what a Ferrari's all about, don't you? See my point? And these are the tools we have, and I think meditation begins to slow everything down and get us into that zone, like that gymnast, like that cheetah, and we can start feeling, yes, I'm saying a very heretical word here. We can start feeling the presence of God in us and in our community. And I don't mean break out in glossolalia and everything else under the sun, but we actually feel something. Let's see, what happened in Acts chapter 4 after Peter and Paul were released and they showed up and the whole church prayed together? The building was what? Shaken. No, I don't know if that was a geo event, but something happened that they felt, didn't it? Yeah. And we have got to get back to an internalized realization and awareness of the spirit in us, <coughs> our, our soul and the spirit in us, resonating with an energy level that causes us to go, I am on fire for God. Jeremiah says, my body will literally burn up if I don't preach the gospel. Of, well, he didn't preach the gospel. You know, his message, his, his, his uh, prophecies. All right. Uh, boy, Tehillim 1, 1 through 2. Okay, more practical applications. This is good. We should train our minds and souls to meditate on the glory and the majesty of God as revealed in natural creation. Better catch it while we still have it. I'm not kidding. God created the heavens and the earth to have you sit back in complete awe and to go, oh my goodness. 
there is something so much greater than me, and I want to be part of that, whatever that is. And that is in the hearts, I believe, of all humans. Into my mind came the glorious majesty and grace of God, inexpressible. The appearance of everything was altered. A calm with the appearance of divine glory in everything. God's glory, his wisdom, purity, love seemed to appear in everything. In the sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds, the sky, the grass, the flowers, the trees, in the water, in all nature. Viewing the moon, viewing the clouds and skies, beholding the magnificent glory of God in these things. Singing forth with a voice of praise, my contemplation of the creator redeemer. That is a person who is experiencing what I'm hopefully in a, just not doing good at all, I feel, trying to get to you. You know why it's hard for me to do this? I'm, a, I'm an engineer, for crying out loud. And this is so not calculable. Right. Calculable. Right. It's, not, it's not something I can sit here and go, oh, I've got control of this. I know how to do this. I can control it and contain it. I can, I can measure it. I can quantify it. And I know what the x plus y plus z to the, to the derivative will be. It can't, it can't be contained this way. What did Jesus say in John 3 to Nicodemus about the Spirit of God? What? You can always see the Spirit, right? You always know what it's up to, right? Especially when it comes and goes, right? And by all means, we get to control it, right? And so there is by definition from our Lord himself who gave us the counselor a dynamic element that we need to recapture. And it's both probably terrifying for some, but I think it gets to a point where it's thrilling, isn't it? And you sit back and you're just in awe and praise of God. Amen? And listen, I love worship teams. Bless their sweet hearts. They can't keep pumping us up trying to replicate this. This should be going on with all of us all through the week, and when we come together, it is just pyrotechnic fire. You know what I'm saying? And the, you know, the, <laughs> the, you know, the Gentile comes in and goes, I don't know what you're doing, but I want part of it. Yeah. Versus I'm not sure what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Oh, I still got more practical applications. <laughs> oh, here we go. Start with rehearsing in one's mind the presence of God. Focus your attention on the inescapable presence, the intimate nearness of God. Start there. Issues of posture, time and place are secondary, but they're important. Do whatever is most conducive to you to concentrate. If the posture is uncomfortable, change it. You don't have to be in the crazy lotus position. Um, uh, I actually know how to do that. And there's some disciplines that come with that. But if it's uncomfortable and it starts getting you back into this realm, stop it. Find something that's comfortable. Uh, If the place you've chosen exposes you to repeated interruptions and distractions, move it. Informative informative reading of the scripture focused on gathering of the information, the increase of knowledge and collection and memorization of data. What am I trying to say there? I think I'm trying to say stop doing that. Uh, Formative reading is to be shaped by the word through the work of the Holy Spirit with informative reading, I'm in control of the text. With formative reading, the Holy Spirit shapes me. That's what I'm trying to say. Whatever you're reading, let the Spirit guide you. Don't try to parse it and figure it out. Just, just go on. Wow, this is crazy. What's going on here? Let the Spirit work. At some point, take the truth as the Holy Spirit has illuminated and talk with God about it, whether in petition, thanksgiving, or intercession. Take the input from the Holy Spirit and the Word and have a personal conversation with God. Guys, read the prophets. They are complaining to God. They are bitter towards their mission. (laughs) They don't understand why they're called to do what they're called to do. And then they turn right around and they go, Adonai, you're amazing. (laughs) But they are having real conversations with Adonai, God Most High, aren't they? Versus, I need this, and I need that, and please help me here, and let's do this, and we all thought we would do that, and what do you think about that? Yeah. You know, that's not what God wants. Yeah. Where possible, place proper names and personal pronouns with your own name. God never intended for his word to flow aimlessly 
an in, interpersonal abstraction. He designed it for you and me. Worship the Lord for he is and what he has done and how it has been revealed in scripture. Meditation should lead us to adoration and celebration of God. We need to get back to a personal time of praise and worship of our God. Amen. Did they, David could have cared less whether, whether there was anybody in Jerusalem. He was going to dance before the Lord, wasn't he? Yeah. That was his personal time to worship before God. And it, you know, you can tell it frosted a lot of people, including, you know, Micah. She's like, yeah, what are you doing there? <laughs> he had a great day. She became barren. What can I say? And so find, get into the practice of having a personal time of worship. Then when you come together, you know how, to, oh, come on, let's just get real. One of us finally breaks out. No. Right? And the rest of her are like, kind of like blue man group. <laughs> I think if we were all practicing a personal worshipful time, we would have no problem. After all, Paul does say, I pray that all men everywhere raise what? Holy, Holy hands to God. I don't know how we deconstruct that one. <laughs> Closing thoughts. I need to shut up. I already read that one. Let's stop with Philippians. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. You guys worry today? Do you worry? Are you full of anxiety? Have you experienced anxiety this week? I believe we are absolutely at plague, pandemic, proportion of anxiety yeah. perfect love John 4 first John 4 says what well, perfect love does what yeah. it casts out fear and so here is what we need to do Paul says don't worry about anything on the contrary make your request known to God by prayer and petition with thanksgiving then God shalom passing all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Messiah Yeshua in conclusion, brothers, set your minds on whatever is true, noble, righteous, pure, love, a bull, adorable, on some virtue. Paul said, Paul's finally said, I don't even care what it is. Think on something good. Uh-huh. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Whatever is good. Are the scriptures good? Yeah. Okay, you better believe they're good. Are a lot of good books good? Yeah. Whatever is good. You get that mind, you get that noggin right here focused on it. So good stuff starts coming out. And you can start enjoying a peace that passes understanding. I'm done. My throat's gone. Got any questions? It's his fault. (laughs) Meditate. 